Um, so today we are going to be talking all about neck pain, the different types of neck pain, kind of because not all neck pain is created equal. So you, what is different neck pain caused by? Whether it's arthritis, is it stability, is it posture, is it something else entirely? Because neck pain is highly correlated with headaches, we're going to go into some headache stuff as well. And then I wanted to get into talking about some of the exercises you guys can be doing to maybe address those things. And also some sneaky things that cause neck pain that maybe you don't think about every day. So if you guys have questions at any time, please let me know. This, this is an open forum, so yell out. I think we're all pretty familiar with each other. If you don't know me, I'm there. And we'll kind of go from there. Um, like I said, we're going to identify the different types of neck pain. Kind of understand how they can cause headaches, those three sneaky causes of neck pain and what causes them. And then find out how physical therapy can help if you guys are interested in jumping that way. So the first one I want to talk about is probably the most common. It's arthritis. You might have heard it as DVD or degenerative disc disease or DJD, which is degenerative joint disease. Um, it sounds scary, but it's really just the kiss of time. I mean, if you've done anything physical with your body over time, you're going to have some amount of arthritis because that's what the body does. It wears down. It's doing the right thing. What happens is when one body part wears down a lot faster than the other is where we see issues. Just like if you were wearing down your tires evenly, it wouldn't be a problem. But if you have one that wears down much faster than the others, then we see issues with driving or controlling your car. Um, sometimes people have a predisposition to getting more arthritis than others. Some of it can be rheumatoid. Some of it can be osteoarthritis. Um, osteoarthritis, basically, over time, because of the wear and tear, bony buildup happens. You hear bone spurs. <coughs> Um, it causes a reduction in space for where the nerves run. You have holes in the side of your neck where the nerves come out. All those nerves come down into your arms and hands. If that starts to lose space, it can get pinched on and it can cause pain. And that can be local pain to the neck or it could be down the arm. Um, it's a, often very painful with rotation or looking up. Usually, if we look down, what happens is as that hole opens up, usually you see pain relief with that. Very similar to the low back, people will bend over to relieve their pain. Similar concept, just in the neck. Um, usually, uh, pain does not go down the arms with this. It's usually just more focal to the neck, at least initially. It gets much more severe than we can start getting pain down the arms with that. Um, a lot of times, people bring in their images and be like, oh my gosh, I have this. I have degenerative disc disease. Okay. Um, imaging does not correlate with pain. We've seen this time and time and time again. Um, I've seen people with absolutely horrible neck pain or neck images without any pain at all. So um, usually we want to correlate that with some sort of functional screen. We use a selective functional movement assessment, but you want to make sure, you know, does that correlate with that? Because yes, there are some people who might be a candidate for surgery. There are a lot of people who aren't and they can manage it conservatively. Any questions on this so far? Beautiful. I'm kind of going fast because I want to get to the meat and potatoes of it. So if I'm going too fast, you let me know, okay? Um, stability deficits, and I would say this is by far the most common thing we see when it comes to neck pain. Um, the intrinsic muscles in the neck, the ones closest to the spine, are designed to stabilize the spine. Very often, those get shut down, whether that's from a trauma, maybe it's posture, repetitive use, or just habit in general. So as those shut down, we supplement our stability with other muscles, and usually they're the bigger muscles that we use in our neck, the big upper traps, our big SCMs, these guys here. Those start kicking in to function as a stabilizer. Those muscles are primarily designed to be movers. They want to move your neck, but if they're always on because they're stabilizing you and you go to move, that's where we see issues because then they're not available to stabilize you. Um, a lot of times people will say, like, I don't know when I'm going to get my pain or, you know, I feel like my head's on a swivel. I don't have any control over it. Uh, they will say that it happens sometimes the first time it'll grab me, but then I can turn again and it won't be there. Um, so it's kind of an unpredictable in nature as far as pain. Um, and it can range from mild, you know, if you're kind of just moving it, it grabs you to very, very intense, depending on the situation. A lot of times stability can be correlated with stress and things like that. So in, in times of higher stress, we end up tensing our muscles. You see pain elevate very, very quickly in that capacity. Um, like I said, it can be related to trauma, posture, overuse, underuse, or weakness. It just kind of depends on what your backstory is. A lot of people nowadays are sitting in front of computers, so posture is a big thing that we talk about a lot. Um, but again, posture is not the whole thing. My favorite saying is that uh, the best posture is your next posture. We are creatures designed to move, not necessarily stay in one position for any period of time, whether it's really, really good posture or really bad posture. 
like we kind of alluded to earlier, um, similar in presentation to the stability. And I would say postural neck pain and stability related neck pain kind of go hand in hand. Usually if you have neck pain, we adopt a posture that puts more pressure on your neck. So we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, it's tied to usually a long period of activity like we alluded to, the desk work, maybe you're working on a car, you're painting overhead, um, and then we get pressure from that. If we have bad posture or poor posture that alludes to more pressure into your neck, then if we're moving through that, we get an irritation, but you've always put more pressure on your neck. It's like a blister you can't get away from. It just keeps irritating it, irritating it, irritating it. So from my side, we want to kind of identify why we're in that position to start with, ease pain, and then move forward with uh, treatment and, and strengthening and stability work. And I get on the bottom item there. Often the neck is doing everything right. It's just doing too much. It's supporting for other things that aren't participating. Sometimes that shoulder, maybe that's mid back, or like we'll talk about maybe even down into the legs a little bit. Any questions on those so far? Beautiful. That sudden pain you were talking about, mm -hmm. that, that burning thing that you get when you move your neck, because I can remember growing up occasionally going. Sure. Um, I, it kind of varies on everybody's experience. You know, pain is kind of unique to everybody. I've heard it is burning. Sometimes it's a grab or it's a stab or it just locks up. feels like they can't move. It doesn't happen again. So yeah. Happens. And then you can, you can move and it's fine. So it's, it's kind of a hiccup. And I, I tell a lot of my patients, it's like a timing belt in the car. You know, if the timing belt's running perfectly, you don't have any issues. Timing belt gets off. You can still drive your car, but it's got a lot of backfires and hiccups. And so a lot of what we do with that is coordinating, getting that timing belt to fire correctly, so to speak. So with neck pain, uh, I guess, how many people have neck pain here? That are interested in beautiful. I'm surprised if you're not here for that. Um, how many people have neck headaches with that neck pain? Sometimes. Okay. How many would you say you have a week? All the time. Doesn't stop. Gotcha. Right. We're, we're talking physical headaches, not work related. Um, so neck pain and headaches, they come hand in hand with that. It, it's almost universal that people who have neck pain will get headaches and whether that stays you know is it in the neck more or does it travel into the head kind of depends on what they're experiencing a very commonly have you heard has anyone heard of the term cervicogenic dizziness cervicogenic headaches basically that means coming from the neck you cause dizziness or headaches um, and i would say that's probably 90 percent of the headaches i treat are related to the neck um, some people will have migraines and that is a multi-factored approach where you might want to look at diet you want to look at maybe some medication some other triggers, some people have sensory, like light or smell that will trigger that. Um, but the vast majority will have headaches related to something coming from the neck. Um, stress and tension play a huge role in that. So kind of different types of headaches, cluster headaches. Um, they're usually more one-sided versus both sides, although that's not universal. Um, and people can like point it out, it's like right here. You know, I feel it here, or maybe it's right behind the eye. Um, it's not this kind of broad, diffuse pain. It's usually fairly focal. Um, and it, like they call it cluster because it's usually a very small area clustered into here. You might have one, two, three spots through that, but it doesn't travel very often. It stays fairly focal and it doesn't usually switch sides. Tension headache, which I would say is, you know, a handful of the people that I see with headaches. It's, it feels like your head's in a vice. Usually can occur on both sides. Often will start in one place and then progress to another if you allow it to get worse and worse and worse. Usually these are the folks that I'm seeing that will say, I'm okay in the morning, but as the day goes on, it gets worse and it gets worse. And if I don't do something, then it just keeps ramping up and it might start here, but travel all the way up into the head. Um, and a lot of times it's unpredictable because it can be stress related or it can be posture related. So people might have low stress, they don't have headaches, but the second the stress increases, suddenly the headaches increase and that can actually increase the stress and it creates this kind of vicious cycle as well. Um, it's hard to pin down because of that, but if we can address a lot of the underlying <laughs> factors and kind of identify warning signs, a lot of times that can be managed well. So why is there pain? And I'm going to take just more of the musculoskeletal approach because you can have a lot of pain from blood pressure and like you were kind of talking about viruses earlier. So that's not necessarily in my wheelhouse. We talk about muscle joints and all that. So we're going to focus on that today. Um, how many people have heard of upper cross posture before? How many people have heard of forward head posture before? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many people see people with their head hanging out Shoulders in front of them? Back and yeah. Down. Yeah, exactly. So forward head posture is, is just where your chin travels forward. Um, upper cross posture is kind of what you see through here. Um, we see tightness and weakness or inhibition 
in across patterns. So if we're sitting, and a lot of our society now is kind of collapsing forward because of the tablets, the cell phones, the driving, and we're just, we're not plowing fields and walking everywhere. We get the convenience of sitting, but that comes with a, a cost. But we get the type upper trap, upper neck, and what we call the Vader scapula, kind of through the neck, base of the skull gets really tight. The chest gets really tight. But as a result, the muscles here that are supposed to stabilize us get really, really weak. And the muscles back here that are supposed to stabilize us get really, really weak as well. And so we tend to collapse more. And when you go to use something, are you going to use what you know is strong or are you going to use what is weak? The body's a me mechanism of efficiency. It's not going to use something that has to work harder without deliberate effort. So you go through your day, you're going to continue to use what you're already really good at using. But if it's pulling you further and further in that pattern, that's where we see some of these chronic pain symptoms start to kick up. Um, we'll talk a little bit about lower cross posture as well, but upper cross posture, particularly pertaining to the neck, is significant in kind of addressing an underlying causes with that. How many people have heard of trigger points before? Yeah, lots of lots of ways to do that. But there's some interesting books out there that studied. They took trigger points or tightness, tight areas in a muscle. They injected it with saline and they asked the people to say, "Hey, where did it go?" Where did you feel that pain? And what you're seeing in the next couple slides, the dots of red are where the pain went. And they, I think they did thousands of subjects. So you get a pretty good idea. If you have a trigger point, you might not feel it where the muscle is tight, but we get what we call referred pain. And that's what we're talking about here. How many people have had a headache that comes around through here? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's called a ram's horn referral, kind of like a ram's <laughs> horn. Um, and it comes from the upper trap. And that's an area that we very, very commonly deal with. Again, if we're thinking about that upper cross posture, it's really, really tight through here. A lot of times you get build up and trenching through here. I can squeeze it and be like, I feel it in my head here. And so when we start to get headaches like that, we can address that area and alleviate them. But Vader Scabula, how many people have had pain like that? Yeah. So, and again, these are individual expressions, but the Vader Scabula, you have the big upper trap muscle, which a lot of people will feel through here. This one sits just below that. And I would say it's often more of a cause of pain than the upper trap. But it can run up into the neck. You might get shoulder pain. Some people will say my shoulder is really messed up. And they might just be that this is actually really cranky. SCM stands for sternal phytomastoid. It's this guy right through here. And it's kind of what we talked about earlier as far as it's supposed to be turning your head. That's its primary role. That being said, if you're underlying stabilizers aren't participating as much as we want them to, the SCM kicks in as a stabilizer, and then it's not available to turn you as much. We see issues with that. Trigger points, just like any other muscle, can build up. How many people have had pressure right behind the eye before? Okay. Some people will confuse this with a sinus headache sometimes. Um, and you do, you know, you certainly can get sinus headaches that does fill up through there, so you got to kind of use your common sense. But addressing these muscles right through here very commonly will alleviate that tension behind the eye. Or some people will report ear pain when I turn, it really hurts my ear. And then I think they have an ear infection. Very, very common for the, the SCM to participate with that. Suboccipitals, this is this has made my career right here, these muscle groups. Sits right at the base of the, the skull here. And they are designed to be the gyroscope of the head. Their primary role is to let you know the position of your head relative to your neck. Um, they're not designed to move. But when we think about that upper cross posture, as we sit through here, these just get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, very, very commonly, they refer through here or right behind the eyes. So you get that kind of pressure behind the eyes. Maybe after sitting for long periods of time or like in front of the computer, you think, oh, my eyes are just tired. Could very easily be the fact that your head is kind of forward and these are just getting tighter and tighter. If I'll pull, let's see. Where is it? These are represented here. And if you look, you've got one two, three, and then this guy's kind of pulled away. There's four of them total. But in those three, they make a triangle, and that little yellow thing coming out of it is what we call your greater occipital nerve that runs right over the top of your head. And so if you can imagine if that gets tight or gets irritated, we can irritate that nerve and you can get pain referred up through there. So very, very common area to have pain on the back of the head or referring to the top of the head. Masser, one of the jaw muscles. How many people notice themselves clenching when they're in pain? Right. So that's a primitive reflex, actually. That's just your body trying to survive. But again, if we have trigger points built up, maybe some people might have what they call TMD or TMJ mm -hmm. from jaw issues. Um, could be because of over clenching and build up of trigger points through there. It gets really tight and can refer pain into the teeth or again, kind of behind the mm -hmm. eye. 
to like general nerves there? Um, that, that doesn't refer to the nerves, but trigeminal nerves do innervate that area. And so they have, you know, jaw pain, one comes up here, one comes down through there. Yeah. Could it irritate those? Absolutely. Um, but what they're reflecting there is, is just more of a muscular referral, not necessarily the nerve referral. Mm -hmm. But they're all kind of in bed together for sure. Temporalis is another jaw muscle. That's the one that sits up through here. So a lot of people might get that kind of pounding or pulsing in their, their temples, and they might just sit here and rub it like that. Sometimes that can be related to clenching as well. And that's another trigger point where it refuses, refers kind of diffusely into the head itself. So how many people think they have stress in their life? That's one. In their life? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> so stress can be good or stress can be bad. Um, stress is what challenges our body to adapt. Um, it's how muscles grow because we stress our muscles. But, you know, our body can only handle a certain amount of stress. And when we hit the different point, stress response becomes negative. And the stress response in humans, how many people know what the fetal position is? That is the stress response in humans. Our body is designed to protect itself. So it wants to pull our in body into that. So when we have pain, high levels of stress, our body feels like it's under attack, we are going to inadvertently and unconsciously tense those muscles that pull us into that stress position. And if you notice, this looks very familiar to that upper cross posture. So if we have a muscle back through here that may be referring to our pain, causing us pain, it's causing us stress. So we inadvertently tense into that fetal position more, it creates a very vicious cycle. So a lot of times with folks with head and neck pain, challenging that stress response and identifying things that create that stress response is the bread and butter for these folks. You know, we can't change the stress coming into your life for the most part, um, but we can change how your body adapts to it. And that's something we do with breathing stuff. We do with just being mindful and kind of saying, let's take a proactive approach. Approach. If you're feeling this, come on, these are the steps you need to take so it doesn't blow up into a full blown headache or neck pain, things like that. So the three sneaky causes of neck pain and headaches. Um, these are some that I, people think that I'm crazy when they do it. Um, and I will tell you that I think everybody should stress their calves because tight calves can be a significant cause of, of neck pain. And the reason being, calves are responsible for pointing your toes. Linda, you might recognize some of those talk, right? So calves are tight. They want to point your toe. If we didn't change anything, we'd be standing like this because our toes are pointed. But we don't do that. What we do is we extend our chin forward to shift our center of gravity back over the top so we don't fall backwards. But if we're here, especially standing for long periods of time, it put a significant amount of strain on the base of the skull, activate all those upper cross postural muscles, trigger points come and we can get headaches from that as well. Along that same thing, tight quads, tight thighs. Um, if those are very, very tight, it's going to want to pull your pelvis forward into this position. Okay? And we don't sit here, stay like this. We come up here like this to make sure we stay important. I'm being very exaggerated with that for <laughs> demonstrative purposes. Um, but think of that, you know, eight hours a day, seven days a week, for the last 10 years of your life, if that habit's there, it's a very hard habit to break. And it can be significant pressure through here. So you think you just have headache after headache after headache. This doesn't really enter into the picture at all. Um, and so then the stiff mid-back. So the mid-back or what we call the thoracic spine. So it's kind of between the shoulder blades through here, base of the neck to the top of the low back. If that is stiff, and particularly with that upper cross type posture, it kind of wants to get us pulled into this position. If we cannot extend through that stiffness, we stay forward here. And again, we end up putting pressure on our neck. More load comes onto the neck versus through the back. Our shoulders aren't available to help stabilize as much and the force to push elsewhere. Okay. And so some of the stuff we'll be talking about today are ways to address that, things that maybe if you have a headache, you're not really thinking about, but let's start thinking about it. So um, things to work on. You guys each here have your hand out through here, but if you want extra copies, the chandlerpt.net slash neck pain workshop, you can download it from there as well. Um, and then the things we're going to work on, and that's what you got in your hand out through here, we're going to kind of go over each one. And I might ask for a very lucky volunteer to hop up here and we kind of show, <laughs> show, show them for everybody to see. Um, we're going to go over chin tucks or chin tucks and lifts, and that's for neck stability and mobility. We're going to go over what we call a thoracic spine roll and a foam roll seated or laying down extension, and that's for your mid-back that we just talked about. We're going to go over a levator scapula stretch to help mobilize that levator scapula that we looked at earlier. We're going to go over what we call a straight leg raise strap stretch, and that's going to be for your calf and leg mobility, more for the back side. Um, we'll just go over a calf stretch in general because that's probably the easiest thing you guys can do day-to-day -day with that. 
we're going to go over a quad stretch to kind of address the lower part of the thigh. And then we're going to go over what we call box breathing and balloon breathing. That's going to help with tension in the neck, but it's also going to help with um, the kind of that stress response and managing the stress response. And then we're going to go over what we call doorway scapular squeezes, and that's for mid-back mobility, shoulder stability. And I chose that one because most people have doors in their house. So if you don't, you let me know um, with that. And then next we will go over sleeping positions. Is anybody super excited to be a volunteer? That wants to <laughs> Linda, let's do this. With <laughs> that through there. <laughs> Bob it up through If we could, can I get you laying right back? Yeah. And then it, what I'll have, most people do, we'll have time after this. We'll have a cradle with um, we'll maybe grab some of the tables here and have you go over there just with that. Um, you can be flat or you could bend the knees if you wanted to here. The chin tuck we want to talk about. We want to keep the back of the head in contact with each other. That was good. Awesome. Thank you. I haven't seen you in a while. I know. It's been a hot minute. <laughs> Back of the head is going to stay in contact. I just want you to draw your chin in as you can reach. And where do you feel that pain? Yeah. Basically, we're re so nice. reversing that upper cross posture. Okay, probably one of the easiest things you can do. I like laying down because it takes the stress of gravity away. Not everybody can lay down. Maybe if you're at work or something, you could do this back in the headrest against your car. You could do it in the seat. You could just kind of do it sitting there if you wanted to. Okay. That's going to get that back of the neck mobilized. We also want to think about strengthening the deep structures. And so with that, we're going to start off exactly with what you just did. Well, that's true. Keep that chin tucked in and lift the back of the head up on the table. Good. And then keep that chin tucked in as you come back down. See, that's the hard part. It's easy to get up. It's hard to come back down with that. That usually exaggerates that bull in the back. But you should feel like you're having to do a decent amount of work through the front of the neck as well. This is what we call your deep neck flexor stability training. That's kicking on all the stabilizers that you've got participating, so we don't have to overuse it. Piece of cake there. Yeah, it's <laughs> it feels pretty good, right? Oh, yeah. Can I get you to lay on a side? It doesn't matter which one. So for the thoracic spinal, and again, most of the instructions should be there. If you have any questions, I'll kind of read through them as we're going through, and you can clarify. Let me bring these up where you can. And then in that position, you want to take that bottom hand. You want to take that bottom hand and hold on to these knees. Bring these up here. That's just going to stay put. We don't want the hips moving. And the knees up high will lock out your low back, so that your mid back has to do more. This hand is going to rest <coughs> on your chest to start with. And what I want you to do is turn your head and shoulders towards the mid back. When you rotate through there, you're going to get a pull through there. That mid back usually, some people even feel it in the hip or down to the leg, and that's fine as long as it's not painful. And usually, what I like to do is on and off. So we go to feel it, and then we come back out. If you really crank your neck without turning your shoulders, you're probably going to feel uncomfortable. We want to turn the shoulders as much as possible. If you want a little bit more of a stretch, we could take this arm, bring it up towards the ceiling, and then reach back with that arm as you rotate, and that adds a little more of a chest stretch. Right there. Yeah, there and if you want even more, you can take your fingers and bring it back like that, okay. especially for folks who use do the lock is because it's going to be tight. That's going to help pull a lot with that. You want to do the other side? Sure. Let's do it. Don't want you walking around circles in the desert, right? <laughs> with these sorts of things, you know, I would, unless you find that you're extremely stiff one side or the other, both sides, I would still do both sides if you do find that there's a difference, but maybe spend a little more time on the all the sets and reps are listed on that. Those are, you know, pretty obscure numbers. If you find you want to do more and it's not causing pain, do it. If it's too aggressive, back it off. I love it. Let's get yeah, safe now. <laughs> and so this is, we're going to talk about the levator scap stretch next. Linda, you're going to pat yourself on your back. You learned it. And then with your other arm, my mirror image right here, you're going to take your head. And I want you to pull. We're going to do two deliberate movements. We're going to tip the head to the side. You'll start to feel a pull there. And once you get that pull, then I want you to tip your head downward towards your arms, and you'll feel even more of a pull with that. 
usually feel something kind of deep underneath here. Do you feel that there? Okay. With a more of a static grip, I tend to recommend 30 second hold. Okay. Um, that's kind of the magic number between we see a change, but above that, we don't necessarily see much more. So we'll spend two, three minutes with that. When we come back out, I do like to make sure that it's a clean motion, that we get to the side first and then come here, as opposed to trying to do both of them. You tend to miss it for whatever reason with that. So coming purely to the side first and then to the game. And the same rules apply, you know, try and do both sides, just go one side tighter, spend more time on it. If they're clean, you're knocking on the edge of that. You're not cranking through pain. This is not a more pain, more gain. There's a difference between that stretch discomfort, which is normal if you're stretching a tight muscle, versus sharp pain, whether it's on one side or the other. We don't want to cranking through sharp pain. Let's get you laying on your back again. I'm going to This is going to be what addresses the calf and leg a little bit. So drop both legs flat for me. <laughs> We're going to take this. So we want two rules here. We want to keep the toe kind of pulled back, and we want to keep the knee straight. Fine, we can stay very straight with that. You're going to use that strap, and we're going to pull it up towards your head until you start to feel the pull. Okay? And usually it's going to be here, sometimes into here. Okay? You're in control of that. Some people like to hold statically. You don't have to go that far if you feel it. Um, and some people, I'll recommend go till you feel it and then back it off and just kind of oscillate on and off like that. There's no magic to that. You will never feel this way for you. Do what you're going to stick with actually doing. So you can hold it like this or yep. you can oscillate. oscillate back and forth. I personally find that I, my body responds better with kind of an on and off. Some people sit there and like the static stretch. You know? I say do whatever resonates best with your body. So right now, Linda's got her toe and her leg pulling up towards the straight side shoulder. We can back that off, and what we can do then is rotate the toe to face the opposite side shoulder and pull slightly to the opposite side shoulder and find even better land. <laughs> and you can do the same thing with that. You can go on and off, or you can hold that static leg. And this is gonna, you, a lot of people will feel this in the calf, but it's also going to hamstring. We have something called fascia. How many people have heard of fascia before? Feel the chicken breast, we got that film in between. It sits on the outside of all our muscles, runs in chains, and helps provide stability for the body kind of dynamically. Um, but that can also get tight. And so that we have a band of fascia that runs from the calf up the back of the leg, actually all the way to the back of the score. And so if that gets restricted, you can have force anywhere on that line of fascia. Want to do this with me? Yeah. <laughs> no. Too long ago. And I think on the sheet it says, you know, 20 repetitions or three for 30 seconds. Again, use your discretion on that. Fully worth, fully worth making effort. Absolutely. Totally worth it. Yeah. Fully worth it. It's a cost. <laughs> Absolutely. And then you could also take it and bring it up here across the body a little bit. This is not coming straight across. It's more of a diagonal towards the opposite shoulder. Does anyone have questions so far? So, remember I was talking about the calves? This is going to address a lot of that calf tension. Okay. But again, if we are pulled here, we're going to have a problem with that. So, this is going to help address that in the lower back. Mm -hmm. Especially with folks who stand and walk a lot, if we have issues down here, that force, every step gets translated up. And if we're giving our neck up in order to compensate for that calf, it's going to be wonderful. Go ahead and stand up off the table. So this is going to be now from the side. For the same kind of reason, if we get pulled out, we're actually going to get sick again. That's just for balance here. So we're going to stretch your thigh out, which I believe is becoming familiar. I find um, that the armrest of your couch works very well. Whether it's the bed, if it's too heavy on probably on this. But the armrest of the couch tends to work pretty well for most people. Have something to hold on to. It's not about balance. You're going to pop your foot up behind you, and we're coming up tall. And we do that, you're going to start to feel a stretch in the front of your hip plane. Okay. And then you're going to hold that for 30 seconds. And for 
for you if if you start to get a hamstring tear, bend your body forward first and then pop the foot up on top of it. And then if you do that, you want to kind of lean back a little bit and get a stretch through that. I like this because most people do this too. I mean, some people will just reach back and grab it and do that. That's totally legal too. Although some people you might not qualify for that. Mm. Possibly with that. So this is this is kind of an equal opportunist when it comes to that. You can have a high risk subject. You know, you don't want to tighten, especially for you and to your knee necessarily. So you'll get that thigh for sure. Mm. Is that strap and hanging on the side of Yep, the exactly. There's a million ways to do it. I not everybody bed is high enough for that. So it's funny that you mentioned that. I, every time I go Right. Lean forward a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you're tight through here and you're trying to bend your leg up through that resistance, it's basically driving the convergence of both legs. This is working overtime to fight that resistance. So you could either bring the knee forward to grab it and then bring it back, or bring your body forward and take the tension off and get it in. Get a little bold that you limit. Pop down off that will get you laying on the back next. So, box and balloon breathing are next. And these, the balloon breathing especially, will help with some of the tension through the neck. The box breathing is geared at more reducing what we call sympathetic nervous system tone, which is that fight or flight protective nervous system tone that wants to pull into that fetal position, and introduce more of what we call a parasympathetic tone, which is more of that rest and relax. And so, we'll start with the box breathing. Linda, you're in through your nose, you're out through your mouth, okay? And what we want to focus on, box breathing is named such because you're going to inhale, you're going to pause, you're going to exhale, and you're going to pause. Like a box, right? So clever. Um, and there's going to be four, I like to start with four second intervals. Which don't, uh, you do, you have So, in through your nose for four seconds, and we'll pause for four seconds. And then you exhale for four seconds, and then you pause for four seconds. And what this does is not only does it force you to be mindful of your breathing, um, but it also paces your breathing. So many times when we are under stress, under stress, we tend to start adopting this at very high respiratory rate with very little air transfer, little sips of air. So, this forces you to pause, and as you lengthen the pause, you could go for five seconds, or six seconds, or seven seconds. It challenges the body's ability to lift carbon dioxide. We have something called respiratory alkalosis, is that when you are breathing so fast, you're basically similar. You blow off more carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide creates an acid in the blood. You need to have a certain pH in the blood. If we have less carbon dioxide because we're blowing off, it basically makes the blood more basic. And it creates a system called respiratory alkalosis, which then can be make you very jittery, very nervous, kind of shaking, very kind of vigilant. And you'll see these people that are just wound super tight. Um, so pacing your breathing forces you to blow off less CO2 and it'll calm your nervous system down in that aspect as well. <coughs> Your mouth, breathing through your nose, or in through your nose, out through your mouth. Um, some people I will have go in and out through their nose. Uh, it's more of a pacing area than anything else. But I like blowing out through your mouth because that deliberate exhalation is actually really good. There's a principle in our body called reciprocal inhibition. If I bend my arm, the bicep is going to be on, and relatively the tricep is off. It is reciprocally inhibited because of that. So when we're thinking about all our muscles through here, these are muscles of accessory respiration that we kick into when we are stressed. They are designed to get us away from the fit or shoot tiger when we were hunting mm -hmm. to get that last little bit of air in. Now, unfortunately, we use them all the time because we're under so much stress. Your phone's ringing, your TV's on, you got a lot of music playing, you're dealing with traffic, and we're sitting in a posture that facilitates. So it forces all that to kind of chill out. When we're breathing out, we reciprocally inhibit the inhaler. I know, perfect segue because we're talking about blowing up the world. Liz, you can stand right there. Lindy, you want orange or orange? Ooh, orange. 
again. No good. <laughs> this is for you to keep. We don't get to reuse them. <laughs> so, yeah. so this is kind of a little bit. And what this really does is force you to exhale even more to tap into that reciprocal energy. Okay. So you're in through your nose, you're out through your mouth. This time you're trying to blow all your air into the balloon. Okay. So you are literally trying to get all your air in your balloon, and then you're going to pause for three seconds. Keep the air in the balloon. Another big breath in through your nose. And then a second breath of air. Pause. Got more air. Keep going. There you go. Pause for three, two. Breathe in through your nose. Then we're going to get a second breath in through the balloon just like you did. Good. For three, two. We'll do it one more time. Go through your nose. Notice that she gets that last little bit of air and a little quiver that you can let all that out there and make a lot of noise. That's so good. <laughs> so that basically is forcibly exhaling. Now there's other ways you can do it. You can use a straw to kind of blow up the balloon. You can just purse your lips and forcibly blow off through that. Sometimes a balloon is an appropriate thing for the top of the <laughs> um, So there's ways to do, get around it. But the resistance, as you put more air in the balloon, it just bites you harder. So it makes it you feel your abs kicking a little bit? Oh, yeah. yeah. So this is a really fun, low-level core exercise that I use a lot for people with even more back pain. But because it kicks in here, we're not using this as much as the diaphragm. We participate more. And then it's Yes, ma'am. Are there special, like, codes that people should follow on this? Talking about that. The next slide is all about pillows. Oh. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> can you hold? Yeah. Can you hold on that? One more. Um, go ahead and sit on up for me. And I'm going to use my arm, and I want you to imagine my arm as you go again. But you, I recommend a lot of people use the door jam. You're going to back up into the door jam so that it's lined up with the length of you. You want to try and get the back of your head up against the door jam as well as the tailbone. And then with that, what I want you to do is think through your shoulder blades and use your shoulder blades to You'll notice she did a really good job of not sending the whole shoulder up. That can be mm -hmm. one. You'll find that a lot of people do that. So you just, I like to hold for 10 seconds, if, or if not more, and then you can relax. That guy gets the don't use the contact. Remember that 10 seconds you did? Mm -hmm. You feel like mid back has to participate a little bit? Mm -hmm. And these are things I don't think people can regulate. Mm -hmm. I love this. Um, and I find for me, the longer you hold it, the better. So 10 seconds, 20 seconds. I've held it up over a minute. You get a stretch for your adult mm -hmm. yeah. So it's kind of taking you out of that forward posture, that flex posture, that fetal position as well. You can combine that with any of your breathing as well. And make you feel like that as well. Yeah, it's going to feel like it cramps through there. Yeah, yeah. yeah cause the, those are those muscles that you're not using. Remember that oh, for cross posture? These guys here and these guys here got a little weaker. So we're asking you to use that. That's how you do it. And how long do you Five seconds. I mean, if you feel like you need more of a scrap and take the time to, to resolve that. But, um, you know, like I said, I don't think you can really get better. Does anyone have questions on those before we jump into a couple other things? And then we'll kind of take take some of the tables and we'll go through those individually. The best way to breathe when you're fine and you feel all over your So, um, exertion with that. Right. I find that trying to slow your breathing helps in the show. You might feel like you need to catch up with that, but you can't. You, usually, the, the question was if you are hiking or doing something different activity, how is the best way to breathe? Um, it kind of depends. Sometimes, if you flex forward, that opens up your chest. You don't have to fight against the gravity of pulling down. It allows your lungs to inhale easier. So, I recommend that a lot. Try to get that through here. But then, pacing your breathing, so try and breathe in. Good deep breath in. And then hold it for maybe five seconds, ten seconds. Because that's going to allow that CO2. It's going to slow your breathing down deliberately. You're going to hate it for the first breath. You're going to have this moment of panic where you feel like you're under the pool and you can't breathe. And that's normal because your body's so used to this golden rule of oxygen or whatever it is available. If you pace it though, your body has to kind of conserve it and use it more wisely the more you do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
The lawn looks great. I just like the. the Should I put cube. the foam roller on the wall if I don't have go down the bottom of your thing? Or you could use the foam roller and squeeze the shoulder blades on that. Totally legal with that. It's just giving you that something to squeeze at, right? Whether you're laying on your back on a foam roller or in a door jam, again, kind of comes down. Not everybody can lay on a foam roller and, you know, that, that work it done. But most people will have maybe a cube or something that they can squeeze on to kind of take that break through the day, which is why I chose that. But again, there's lots of options for that. If you have a foam roller and want to do it on that, I mean, I'll break my arm. Not even gonna take away. So you're standing like that? Yeah, you might have your feet a little bit for you so you kind of lean into the door jam, but tailbone to the back of the head are in contact with everything. Other questions before we move on? So, Linda, you were asking kind of what the best pillow is, right? Um, sleeping positions and pillows are very unique to an individual. Um, people ask me all the time about pillows and mattresses, and I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all. I do think that if we look at that upper cross posture and what we see get tight and what we see get stiff, particularly with the mid-back, we can play a role with that. What's your normal sleeping posture? Are you on your side, stomach, back? Side. Side? Okay. Side. So what I find with a lot of times, with side sleeping, we want to make sure the pillow fills from our ear to our shoulder. Okay? So if it's too thin, we drop our head like that. That's problematic, especially over you know, six to eight hours, maybe 10 if you're lucky. Um, and so we also don't want to overfill to push us away in that capacity. So finding that kind of size pillow that keeps you neutral. But if we take it and look at it from this side, a lot of people do this to snuggle into their bed. Yeah. And that's recreating this through here. So what I recommend for side sleepers is bringing the pillow back so it hits you here so that when you're in a neutral position from ear to hip. Try not, because if the pillow's not there, you're not gonna drop your head forward with that. Very weird at first to kind of do that because you're so used to kind of doing that through here. But again, that feeds into a lot of that neck pain, particularly over long, prolonged periods of time at night. So if you can be here versus here, when you start sleeping a lot of times, that'll help stick long-term. Bring the, bring the pillow back because a lot of people put their head right in the middle of the pillow yeah. and then you have a lot of room to cover it forward if you take that room away you're not going to let the head drop off the end of the pillow so it kind of unconsciously cues you to keep your head back so to speak someone's laying on their back how many people are back sleepers here beautiful okay um i recommend two pillows maybe a, a thicker pillow and a thinner pillow do you mind if i steal you yeah and we can kind of show you since you are back sleeper through there So I'm gonna grab one of the pillows. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can definitely show you. And we'll have that opportunity when we get to break it out too. Yeah. So we're gonna just lay on your back a little bit. And so we're gonna see we're relatively stiff in the mid back. And you'll notice that this head has kind of dropped back and we've got an arch here. Now we should have a little bit of an arch, but the head's kind of how many pillows do you use? Yeah. One. Yeah. Five pillows. People love that. Thing. <laughs> some people love it. Some people are very polarized. Yeah, my husband doesn't like it. Right? Yeah. So what I would recommend, because we're sitting here, we want to see kind of feel that And we're going to take one pillow from here. This is for the back of the shoulders, and then we're going to stair step the other pillow here. So your shoulders are going to go here. Back of the head goes here. Mm -hmm. Goes out through there, and so what happens? This might be a little thick on the top side. Mm -hmm. I, I would go a little thinner with that, so mm -hmm. it's actually pushing you forward. Mm -hmm. But what that does is take the mid back stiffness into account, and so then you have some shoulder support, and your head doesn't move. And so that takes that kind of posture out, which tends to give the headaches in the morning in the middle of the night. Wake up, feel like your neck super super. Right. Mm -hmm. So usually a little thicker pillow on the bottom, maybe a little thinner like the my pillow because you can kind of shape it like that right, on top, yeah. and that takes you into that kind of stiff neck position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have two pillows, but I usually just do it when I'm leaving. Right. And, and that would, I mean, you, you don't want two thick pillows because you can certainly right. err on the wrong yeah. side, and that's equally as bad. Yeah. But you want to keep it from back, but not push you forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. That yeah. makes sense to everybody else. Mm -hmm. How many people sleep on their stomach? Well, I used to, until I had kids. Right. Realigned the whole time. True. We have you actually before we tell you, so lay on your side. You know, you want to have maybe two pillows here. A lot of people laying on their side from here who want to throw their head forward like that. So what I recommend is just hold it out through here, bringing it back to the edge of the pillow is right at their cheek. 
So if she lets her head go forward, it's going to fall off the pillow. And so we want to kind of keep it right on the edge of that, so then you don't need it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And on that, that back thing, um, I'm thinking like a hip check. Yeah. No, if the bed's lifted up like that, that takes into account. But keep in mind, even if your shoulders up and your head's keeping back, it doesn't matter what position you're in. You just want to make sure the head is neutral. Okay. For something like that, it might just be one pillow. Yeah, okay. but it kind of depends on the angle of the bed. Honestly, the stiffness where you come back. Stomach sleepers? Oh, thanks so much. I, I would recommend supporting your low back with a pillow. Or your chest with a pillow. In that regard, again, we're really stiff to the mid back, we're laying on our stomach, it's gonna to want to push you back through there because you don't have that deep here into the, the pillow or into the bed. So if we pop this underneath here like that, it allows our head to kind of translate forward and you have a little more room before it jams back from the pressure. But do you not have a pillow? I would have a pillow here. Some people's low back really bothers me. So if you need to pop the pillow under that, because that's gonna support your low back like that. But up through here, as we're here, when we drop through here, I've got more room to fall my head here versus if I'm flat, this would push up right out of the face. So then no pillow by the head? No pillow by the head, or maybe a very thin one. Yeah, that's what we have to have. But I definitely recommend, recommend more top. Mm -hmm. that. Questions on that? So um, physical therapy, we see this every day. Um, but so how can physical therapy help? Part of it is going to be some of the exercises we just talked to. And that's gonna say, hey, let's make sure you're doing that on your end at home to get that consistent. So much of this is habit and some of the other stuff we do, how many people have been dry needling? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> dry needling is a trigger point management tool. So all those referral pain stuff, we could use that to address those tight areas to hopefully reduce referral pain. Do you want reflexology test? I would say think of it more like acupuncture. Okay, it's the same needle as acupuncture, but it's a little different. And acupuncture is more geared towards energy. They believe that the, there's meridian lines in your body, and along those lines are chi points. And the belief is that using the needle changes the chi, energy flow changes body habits or you know illness things like that. Whereas I'm literally feeling for a knot in your muscle and using that needle to release it. What about acupressure? Acupressure is going to follow the same line, but it uses like a pressure either from a tool or from a hand mm -hmm. on those acupuncture points. Mm -hmm. so people, yeah. And so, I mean, again, we have you have trigger point massage, trigger point work, or neuromuscular work. Same kind of wheelhouse of that. We're addressing the trigger point behind the muscle, right? The goal is to change how the trigger point behaves. We have too many trigger points in a muscle, the muscle doesn't behave normally. Well. And so then we have altered movement patterns, compensatory patterns, and a lot of issues. That's, I, I put it in this management. Yeah. You need management? <laughs> yeah, I do need management <laughs> with that. Um, how many people have had Graston before? That's what? Graston before. Oh, is that that thing? That, the, that's the scalpel. This is Delilah. Yeah. My own personal one. Yeah. Yeah. So what we call instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, we're using another tool to help the tissue move. Okay. A lot of times if we have chronic tension, chronic tightness, muscle layers kind of bind together, that fascia gets really gummed up. And so then it's not sliding very easily, it's kind of stuck into a big chunk. And that can be painful and limiting. Something like this is gonna be repetitive motion or pressure is inhibitory to the muscle, that's why massage works. So that in part will help loosen the muscle. But if we do have any sort of those fibrotic changes, we will often mechanically help break some of that muscle. Helps get it loose. Right. Well, Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's, you know, a lot of times, like, is, is soreness normal? Absolutely, right? Um, I, I tell people all the time, it's like your whole under grocery bag. Mm -hmm. If you let go, would your hand be sore when you let go? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But if the more you meditate, it, it would be feeling better. And that's what we encourage a lot of people. That's partially why we give some of the exercises out. We want you to keep that motion going. Say motion is motion. You know, the more you move it, the better it's feeling. The more fluid shape you get, particularly if you have stiffer joints or arthritis, the more we move it, it creates kind of like a pump action. Like how many people had to pump water from a well, right? The more you do that, the more fluid you get in there. So if you do have some sort of inflammation, it's actually to loose that inflammation out and it's less pain aggravated. Is that the same tool that Savannah uses on my spot? <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
might be. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Or some variation. We got six other variations oh, back okay. there. So other um, we got some that fit maybe a little more specific to like different cattle. Mm-hmm. The idea being that we have joint mobilization, joint manipulation. Um, how many people have had a chiropractic adjustment? So same kind of wheelhouse, just we can't call it adjustment, we call it manipulation. Um, or mobilizations is where we don't actually take you to end range and zap you. We just kind of gently tease the thing. Very similar to kind of what we're talking about when we're creating that well pump kind of fluid movement. It's a great tool for that. People love it on the mid back, get the moving a little bit better, and then you have other opportunities to hold it. Um, and then, of course, the exercise. We also have kinesio tape, um, which is kind of a postural reminder. Have you, have you ever been taped? Okay. Um, you can see that. So, it, it's going to feel like a hug. You ever slip like a knee sleeve on mm-hmm. and it feels just like that extra compression there? Kinesio tape does that. But what's nice is that you can put it on any body part. You can leave it there a couple days. So it's going to last longer than you remembering to stand up. It's going to mm-hmm. be kind of that unconscious reminder for a little more period of time. But for, particularly for neck pain, I love it. If you do have some sort of irritation or inflammation, it also picks up the top layer of skin. And underneath that layer of skin is what we call your lymph system. The lymph system helps export waste products out and uh, cool it out. So if we can pick that up and encourage more mobility, especially through joint exercises, it helps get rid of part of the product there. Well, I wanted to ask before yep. about cupping. Yes. The cupping, how can that help? With Absolutely. Your I love cupping, so I'm glad you come up today. Um, so cupping is it's kind of the reverse of the tool. You're still going to get soft tissue mobility, but rather than compression, it's contraction, vacuum. So it's nice in that a lot of times the way we use it, we get it on there, we'll kind of move it back and forth just like people yeah, the tool. Keep it going. Yep. Or we can leave it static and set in place. And that's when you saw the Olympics with people getting big black and blue marks. Yeah. Um, I usually don't leave it on for longer than a couple minutes. There's some people out there that might leave it on for 20, 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. I personally, in my practice, haven't found that to be any more beneficial than on a couple minutes. But, you know, it's designed to promote a vacuum. And when you promote a vacuum, you increase circulation through that area directly. So sometimes trigger points can be deep. It's like a Chinese finger trap. It just gets tight and you can't release. Something is very good at promoting mobility through there. Drive easy blood flow to it. And again, it creates that circulation so then you can export it. How do you know which kind of cup to get? You know, there's a lot of them out there. I What we stock in and sell to our patients are silicone cups mm-hmm. because they're flexible. They can kind of fit around sort of the bony prominences through here without moving suction. So they're um, shaped differently. They're all different, different shapes. Sizes. Yeah, the ones I use, you have <clears throat> the small one looks just like a witch's hat, um, and it's used for real small stuff. They, they technically say it's for the face, but I find it's really nice for hands mm-hmm. or small areas. It's, it's a circle, it's not that big, but it's kind of tall. The next one up is the medium one. It's about yay big, okay, and it's just a bell shape one. And then you kind of squeeze it, you pop it on, and let that go. It creates that vacuum, and then you can move it on. You can move it to the bell shape, and then the larger one. Obviously, the bigger you get. More aggressive they get, mm-hmm. but the more you squeeze, the less you squeeze can dictate pressure. So you got some variability in how tight you get. Other questions there? Beautiful. Um, breathing. You guys didn't know. I did write a book on it. That's a link for that. Um, it's breathebetter.co. Um, we've got an online course for that, and there's also um, paperback and ebook version of that. If you guys want to follow along and learn a lot more, we're on YouTube and pretty much every other social media on the face of the planet. So you can definitely check out that. And then if you are interested, you can definitely contact us with questions. Phone numbers on there. If you're interested in sitting down more one-on-one and saying, hey, this might be more specific to me. You want to talk to a therapist. We do have discovery visits. Half hour, we sit down. We run you through a whole assessment and say, yeah, this is more what you're looking like versus this. This might be the plan of care we chase if you want to go that way. Maybe try X, Y, and Z exercises. So that's always available for you. Are all well. those other links on this site? They are on that site. Okay. Yep. And I will e- email this out to you guys with that so you have copies of all of this as well and the exercises as well. So you'll have copies of that. Does anyone have questions for me? Yes, ma'am. Um, besides the right. you know, home, right. and I I'm up because I really don't. I don't want to be doing upper body. Yeah. Sure. I want to do the stuff that's very dangerous. And I'm in minimal. Like recommendations as far as right. machines and exercise? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, you know, depending on every gym has their own type of stuff, but what might be more beneficial is like 
what to watch out for posture wise. And if you feel yourself in that position with that particular machine and you can't change it because of the machine, then we need to discontinue that. So because you know, one one pulley machine might not be equivalent to what's at Planet Fitness versus LA Fitness. Right. Type so yes, ma'am. Right. You know, that's the simple. I would say any sort of prolonged position at any given time, even if you're in the correct posture, can be detrimental. So I'd say move regularly. Every commercial, try and shift maybe a little position, turn one side versus the other. Um, I would say in general, is it is the TV at the foot of your bed and one of the sides? Yeah. Okay. So maybe elevate your head a little bit. So you're li not a little reclined, but you're not fully back. So you're not having to do this the whole time. So you can kind of do that. But then, you know, change. So we rotate and you have a little more pressure on your left versus pressure on your right. Um, and do it frequently because, you know, the curse of being a human is that we're not designed to stay still. Like, so move regularly would be my solution to that as well. Any other questions before we kind of go into the exercises? Exercise for growth. No, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, <laughs> you don't have to. If, I mean, you're free to move about the cabin if you want to do that. If you want to stick around and have uh, you know a conversation on that, you certainly can. Okay, you're welcome. Well, let me give this really quick, and then we'll jump into it.